Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks uh, very much for inviting us to be here today. Um, I'm not going to be uh, trying out my GCSE French on you. You'll probably be relieved to know. Uh, but what I will be doing, as uh, Jean says, is talking about the, the state of open source in 2009 um, as we see it. And also been asked to just, just give a brief overview uh, before that um, on um, how we got where we are today. So um, I think it's important to, to remember where free software uh, started out in the 1980s, I said here it's actually avoiding vendor lock-in. I would see that that actually, actually was a mistake of mine. It's also more about actually control of the software. That was what Richard Stallman was, was more con concerned about, was the control the vendors had on the software, how it could be used, what machines it could be used on, who it could be used by. And so created uh, the GNU project, and we saw other projects formed in the 80s uh, around free, um, and then into open source software. So in the 90s, then we saw uh, the early adoption of uh, uh, Linux uh, and Apache, for example, and, and free and open source software really begin to challenge this establishment in terms of uh, the, the licensing of software and the development of software. And it's also the, what we begin to see is of, uh, the war between open source and, and proprietary software about how uh, you go about development and licensing. They got it. Um, moving on into, uh, into this decade, we saw uh, free and open source software has now become an accepted building block of enterprise computing. I'll go on and talk about that in a moment. And looking towards the next uh, decade, uh, we see free and open source software becoming a key driver for digital recovery, uh, not just an accepted part of the, the, open, uh, the software industry, but a really a key driver, a focal point for driving the recovery and, uh, and benefit, benefiting citizens. And that has led to something we've seen this year that we, I think we haven't seen before, which is, uh, as you've already seen on the slides, multiple sort of declarations um, that the war between proprietary and open source software is over. And not just that, but actually that open source has won. And a key example of that was uh, an article published by The Economist in May in which they made the point uh, the, the argument is one. I think if you have you know, a, a, a publication like The Economist talking about free and open source software and declaring it to have won the argument and be an accepted part of the industry, I think that gives you, you know, a key indication of uh, quite how far free and open source software has come. So how has it got to this level? Well, the main reason is, is because open source is now u ubiquitous. Um, one of the statistics that you hear a lot, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot over the next two days, is uh, one from one of our fellow analyst firms, Gartner, who said last year that they think by 2012, 90% of organizations around the world will have open source somewhere in their, in their data center on their desktops. I think we at the 451 group would actually see that as being a conservative estimate. Um, but really, if you, you know, if it's 92%, 94%, you know, really picking hairs, the, the key message there obviously is that overwhelmingly organizations are using open source in their, um, in their uh, technology, uh, in their data centers. End user adoption is also increasing. Another of our uh, fellow analyst firms, IDC, um, got a lot of attention this year when it increased its prediction for the open source software industry, I think for 2013, from, from about 6 billion to 8 billion, which is obviously you know, an indication of, of the growing adoption of open source. But it is worth, um, you know, we're not going to dispute those numbers, but I think it's worth thinking about that in the context of the overall software industry and what that represents. And you know, a good estimate is maybe that's 2% of the software industry. So free and open source has an enormous reach uh, in terms of end user adoption. What it doesn't have yet is penetration. Well, obviously the flip side of that is that there's a huge opportunity here for, for free and open source software moving forward. Um, we would say also that open source software is pervasive, and looking, we're looking here not necessarily at adoption, but the usage of open source by proprietary vendors or traditionally proprietary vendors. And um, you know, we get to the extent uh, today where we see um, you know Oracle, Microsoft, IBM, HP, SAP, Adobe all using open source, or contributing to open source, or making use of open source within their products, and they're all using open source. Um, on their own terms and using it to their advantage. And there we go. And uh, what we see is, is that um, you know, mixed models, 
uh, have come to dominate. We've done a lot of research um, in the 451 group about how businesses of all types make money from open source software. And, um, and what we, you know, one of the main findings was that you know, the, the, the lines are blurring between proprietary and open source software. Open source is embedded in proprietary products. Uh, open core vendors, as they've come to be known, are providing proprietary extensions added on to open source. And uh, another point on this is that modern communities, uh, I think you know, the individual developer still has a vital role to play in open source, but modern communities you know, are vendor-led and are dominated by vendors. And I know Andrew's going to talk a bit about that, so I won't go into too much detail on that. Obviously, you know, another issue we see here is, is M&A activity involving open source uh, companies, and you can see some of the prime examples there. We don't really have time to go into detail, but I'm sure it will be talked about over the next couple of days. And lastly, there you know some examples of how traditional proprietary companies have got involved in open source. Microsoft contributing to Linux, creating the Codeplex Foundation. Which, whatever you might think of those initiatives, you know you think you can see that that's progress and something that just a year ago would have been pretty much unthinkable. Um, when we think about uh, proprietary vendors and how they've got involved in open source. I think the traditional view has been sort of this, them acting as kind of a, a King Canute type figure, you know, trying to hold back the waves of open source. And what we've seen is not just, you know, sort of commanding the waves to go back, but actually building barriers, building walls, attempting to hold back the waves. And what we've seen is over time, the waves of open source keep coming and slowly erode, erode those barriers until we get to a point where the vendors realize that if they're going to survive in the long term, then they need to stop building barriers and start building boats and find a way to, to ride the seas of open source and to coexist with open source. Um, and the result of that, I'm going to just stop pressing the buttons, is that, um, as Matt Acey says here, we see that um, you know, virtually uh, open source is now in virtually all software, whether it's open source or proprietary. Now that does beg the question, and we made the statement, that, or the statement has been made that open source has won. Um, you know, is that any kind of victory for free and open source software? I'm sure there's a lot of people here uh, today who would not see that as any uh, as any kind of victory at all. Uh, you know, free software just being you know appropriate, appropriated even by open source vendors. And um, we have seen this year considerable pushback from uh, free and open source uh, supporters. Um, resisting what they would see as the dilution of the open source brand. And um, you know some examples of that. I think there is a real move to take the um, open source definition, obviously, which applies to open source licenses, and kind of reapply that to development models and um, to business strategies. And um, we would see that actually, you know, you, you yourselves may, may argue about whether that's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. But I think if you're going to do it, the time to do it is now, because you know the the, the, the strength of the proprietary vendors and the strength of these mixed models um, uh, are coming. Uh, but the point it has to be remembered is that uh, you know, mixed models are not inevitable. Uh, we certainly see, you know, if you look at the most successful uh, open source company, Red Hat, it, it does not mix uh, proprietary uh, and open source code. And there's many, I think, companies, vendors here today, and many users here today that, are, that would choose not to mix proprietary and open source code. But the important thing to remember is that even if you yourself choose not to do that, um, you know, open source, free and open source software does not exist in isolation, and it, there does you do need to interoperate with proprietary code. If not in your own data center, then with your partners and uh, with your customers. Okay, and it would make the point that isolationism um, perhaps could be just as damaging to open source as the dilution of the open source brand by you know, the, these mixed models. So I think there's a, there's a, uh, a balance to be, to, be, uh, to be worked out here. And we're back to the, you know, the image of King Canute here. But rather, we would now see it's, it's potentially free and open source advocates that are the Canute figure trying to hold back the waves of the mixed models. And the question, I think, if you're in that position, you need to ask yourself is, are you going to try and build barriers? Are you going to try and build walls? Or are you going to try and build boats and try to find a way of coexisting on your own terms. Which begs the question, you know, is war really over uh, for open source? I think clearly, perhaps the question of, you know, the acceptance of um, open source licensing 
uh, is no longer really discussed. It's, it's well accepted. But there are further issues um, related to that. And we see a couple here. Returning to the Economist article, you see here they said, you know, open source software has won the argument, but there are new, there's a new threat to openness. And Mark Taylor from, uh, from Sirius, an open source vendor in the UK, um, did a sort of follow-up article on that, talking about how open source may have won the argument, but it doesn't mean the world suddenly changes. And what uh, Mark was talking about there in particular was procurement policies as they relate to open source. We've seen in Europe and um, just more recently in the UK, uh, policies uh, published by governments encouraging the use of open source by government agencies and obviously uh, by, by, um, by enterprises. Um, and those only go so far because the issue is that the procurement practices that are, that are in use by those enterprises and those government agencies um, have been set up to deal with the traditional licensing uh, and you know, traditional proprietary way of licensing software. So it's often very difficult for open source software to get a foot in the door and to get uh, considered um, for, for procurement. So that's uh, one of the, the main sort of battles that we would say beginning to happen now and is going to continue uh, into 2010. What The Economist was referring to was uh, open data, the issue of open data as it relates to cloud computing and the idea of platform locking. And we at the 451 have done a lot of research about cloud computing and we would take a view, I think that open source has a very a strong role to play in cloud computing um, in preventing uh, you know, that, that platform lock-in. Although that's perhaps you know, a subject for an entirely uh, different uh, presentation. Um, and obviously time is short, so we don't have uh, time to go in uh, to all of these, but some of the, the key areas that I think will be discussed, obviously, um, at the event in the next couple of days uh, that we would see as the key battlegrounds are, are issues related to patents, standards, open access, and open government. Uh, but two that I wanted to just um, to, to call out, uh, just to, to uh, conclude on really, is open source as the issue of uh, as, as civic participation and open source as a public resource. We've seen since the Obama administration was elected, obviously in the US, a lot more talk about you know, open government and a lot of talk about open source. And I don't think we've seen particular policies related to open source coming out of there yet. But what we have seen is recently the director of new media for the White House, uh, Mason Phillips, talking about open source as, as he so often is the best form of civic participation, of connecting the government to the citizens. And I think we've seen a similar thing in, here in Europe with the European Commission and the way in which it is, uh, is looking at open source as a way that it can boost the regional economy and boost civic participation. And, um, and another side of the European Commission's interest in open source is this issue of, of open source as a public resource. We recently saw um, the European Health and Safety Standards Office talking about its duty as a, as a public body to invest public funds in open source software so that it can be reused, so that you know, it can, they can boost collaboration. And I think you know, this is going to be one of the main areas that we'll see an extension of, sort of the, the battleground around open source and free software uh, moving forward. And we see that, I think, in the, um, the 2020 FLOSS roadmap, uh, the addition of a new... Uh, recommendation about treating open source as a public resource. And I think that's in this context that open source, having gained the acceptance to, to, you know, to stand alongside proprietary software uh, and be recommended there, actually to move on from that and to actually drive the recovery of, uh, you know, of, of, of the industry worldwide and particularly, I'd say, the open source uh, industry in Europe. And uh, just my details here, if you want to follow up with us, I'll find out some more about the 451 group. Um, and I'll be publishing a few more detail, uh, thoughts on this later today on our blog. So I'd encourage you to be there and uh, take a look at that. Thank you.